School's First Day of School, story by Adam Rex, pictures by Christian Robinson. That summer, they dug up the big field and poured the foundation and set brick on top of brick until they'd built a school. A sign above the door read, Frederick Douglass Elementary. That's a good name for me, thought the school. Most days, a man named Janitor came to mop the school and buff his floors and wash his windows. This is nice, the school said to the janitor. Just the two of us. Won't be just us for long, said the janitor. Soon the teachers will come, and then you'll be filled with children. The school creaked. Children? All kinds of children. They'll come to play games and to learn. Oh, said the school. Will you be here? You'll see me after the school day is over, said the janitor. Don't worry, you'll like the children. But the school thought that janitor was probably wrong about that. Then they came, the children did, and there were more of them than the school could possibly have imagined. They got everywhere. They opened and closed all of his doors and lockers. And drank water from his fountains and played on his jungle gym. So that's what that is for, thought the school. Some of the older kids gathered by the school's back fence and showed each other their bored faces. This place stinks, said one, and the school gasped. I hate school, said another with puffy hair, to the agreement of his friends. The school sagged a little. One very small girl with freckles didn't want to come inside the school at all. Her mother had to carry her. I must be awful, the school whispered to himself. Later, he squirted the puffy-haired kid in the face and then felt bad about it afterward. He watched the kindergarten kids sit on one of his rugs. The teacher said, as we go around the circle, please tell us your name. There was an Aiden and a Max and a Bella and another Aiden and an Emma and a Caden and a Chloe. The small girl with freckles was next. But she wouldn't speak. She only stared at her shoes until the teacher moved on. I don't like school, she whispered into her lap. Well, thought the school, maybe it doesn't like you either. The children were in their chairs, finally. But just as the school was starting to relax, his fire alarm sounded, and all the children exited and walked to the other side of the field and stared at him. He was so embarrassed. He held his doors open for them when they returned. Sorry, he said, as the first child entered. Sorry, 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 he told them all, even the girl with the freckles. At 12 o'clock, the school was filled with food. At 12.30, the school was filled with garbage. At one table, a boy told a funny joke, and another boy laughed so hard that milk came out of his nose. Now I'm covered with nose milk thought the school. He had to admit that it was a pretty funny joke, though. Even the girl with freckles liked it. After lunch, the kindergarten kids learned about shapes. A rectangle has four sides, said the teacher. One, two, three, four. And a square has four sides, too. In fact, a square is actually a special kind of rectangle. Wow, said the school. I did not know that. Afterward, the children made pictures with glitter and paste. The girl with freckles made a picture of the school. It looks just like me, thought the school. Except glittery. It's like she's known me all my life. Do you think I could have your picture? The teacher asked her. Don't tell anyone, but I think it's the best. The school thought she was probably right about that. The freckled girl smiled when the teacher struck her drawing onto the school wall with a pushpin. Ouch, said the school, but he didn't mind, not really. At 3 o'clock, the parents came to pick up the children. At 3.30, janitor came to pick up the school. I was full of kids, the school told him. And I heard a joke, and I accidentally had a fire drill, but everyone was nice about it. And I listened to a classroom and learned about shapes. You had a big day, said janitor. Do you think, the school said, Do you think you could invite everyone to come back tomorrow? Especially that little freckled girl. Janitor nodded. I'll see what I can do. Later, Janitor sat on top of the school, and they watched the sun go down. In the beginning, I didn't know what I was, said the school. I thought I was your house. 
Nope, said janitor. I, I suppose some other place gets to be your house, the school added. Janitor nodded. That's true, but you get to be a school. That's lucky. And the school thought he was probably right about that. Good evening, Conroe ISD family, and welcome to our live event here as we wrap up the month of September. My name is Curtis Knoll. I'm proud to be your superintendent of schools. What a wonderful way to start our time together tonight as we enjoyed that book reading by many of our school namesakes. You may recognize a lot of those names uh, as you saw them. Uh, we celebrated reading this month in Conroe ISD. It's Read for a Better Life Day occurred just a few weeks ago. We celebrate reading each and every day, but we go out of our way to have a special time during this month. And I hope that you know, your child's school celebrated and that uh, you were able to talk about reading in your home and that you are dedicating that time each night to read to your children and read with your children. We know that that is the most impactful thing that you can do uh, is to help your child become a great reader. So what a wonderful celebration. Proud that you're here tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your night to join us. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, know that um, these are fairly unscripted, just conversations that we like to have with the community. We, uh, we try to share a little bit more background about our information of what we're doing and why we make decisions, kind of a little deeper than what we could share in an email. We do follow these up with an email that gives just the basics, but uh, this gives you a little bit more uh, conversation around it. And then we do try to hit some live questions at the end. So uh, we'll do that again tonight as well. So our goal tonight is we're going to talk a little bit about the beginning of the school year. We're going to share our COVID numbers, our current COVID numbers, and what impact uh, that has on us. And then we'll move to those questions uh, at the very end. Well, it's been about four weeks or exactly four weeks since the last time we were together uh, for a live update. And I will tell you, it's been a great four weeks. Um, so many positives have been occurring here in Conroe ISD and, and on our campuses and throughout our community. Um, one of the big celebrations, we say welcome to over 200 new students since we last met uh, just four weeks ago. So that puts our current enrollment now at 67,823 students. So uh, we're glad you're all here. Welcome to our newest students as well. We're, we're proud that you've joined us here in Conroe ISD. Now we, uh, in addition to being four weeks out and, and approaching the here the end of September and looking at October, we're also nearing the end of our first grading period. So the first nine weeks will come to an end uh, at the end of next week, next Thursday. And so this seems like a very good time to, to have a wrap up of our first uh, grading period as well. So one thing I can tell you and, and share with you that these events are much easier to plan for when I know that I get to come here and share uh, a lot of good news with you. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We have an opportunity to share good news, uh, things that we can all be proud of. I think things that will help us all feel more comfortable. Uh, and that, like I said, makes it easier for me to come in and prepare through this process to come and speak to you this evening. You know, uh, when I talked to you four weeks ago, I, I shared with you that I believed it was okay to be concerned and deliberate about our actions, but at the same time being optimistic and hopeful about the future. And uh, I think that that has proven to be true over these last four weeks. We've been very deliberate about what we were doing and how we were approaching the situation, but um, we did not take a doomsday approach that it couldn't be done. Quite the opposite of that. We, we told you then that we could make this happen, and I'm proud to tell you that we are. Uh, like I said, it's school is going really well. One of the best parts of my job, absolute best parts of my job, is getting to be in our schools uh, on a daily basis. And you can follow me um, through that process if you would like. I have a Twitter account. Uh, it's Conroe ISD Soup, and, and you could follow me. And I try to post pictures. Some days I'm better than others, and I'm not always a great photographer. And sometimes I just get so um, caught up in watching what's going on in our classrooms that I forget to take um, pictures. But I try to share pictures as I visit each and every one of our schools. That's the plan. And I'm about halfway through. When I go to the schools, I spend about an hour and get to walk around with the principal and sometimes the assistant principals or counselors or instructional coaches, and we visit classrooms. And I will tell you that is so uplifting to see the wonderful things that are happening in our classrooms in Conroe ISD. Students are happy, students are engaged, and they're learning. And our teachers are amazing. Uh, every school that I go to, I learn something. 
uh, from watching the teachers and, and my background as an educator has been more in the secondary schools, so junior highs and high schools. Uh, and I love, so I love going to those schools because that, that feels comfortable, feels like home to me. But I learn so much when I walk into elementary classrooms. Every single time uh, I, I pick up skills that I, I wish I would have known um, when I was on a campus. But um, I want to say thank you to our teachers tonight. And I know that we talked about that last time about expressing gratitude um, for everyone. And I want to do that again tonight. Thank you to our teachers, um, to all staff members, counselors, administrators, bus drivers, cafeteria, to all the departments that are, that are working behind the scenes, everybody that's involved uh, in making this happen. Because it's still not easy, right? There's still challenges each and every day. And yet, when you go into the buildings and you look in the eyes of the children, they are having wonderful days. And that's, that's why we're all here. That's the purpose of what we do. And so our objective is being met. And, and I just want to say thank you to everybody that's help, helping make that happen. So you can follow me uh, if, if you'd like and see those pictures. And, and what you will see when you see those pictures is even though everything we do right now is hard and we know it, it's worth it. Like there, there is no question um, that the struggles and, and the fight is worth it uh, to have our children in school because we would not want to take away their opportunity to be uh, away from their peers and our wonderful teachers. So uh, having our schools open, uh, even when it's hard, it's absolutely worth it. Now, uh, you know, we know that it's not perfect yet either, right? We still have challenges. Uh, we still have some staff challenges, be it through transportation or substitute teachers on, on any given days. We have some procedures and rules that we have to go through. And so it's not yet perfect, but with flexibility and with grace, uh, we can do it. And we've proven it. You know, there were many um, that four weeks ago were, were convinced uh, and, and, and shared their opinions with me that we had no opportunity to, to make this year successful. And we were going down a track that wasn't going to work. And yet, here we are today. Uh, we're going to share uh, some really good news and really good numbers with you um, today as well. So that that's awesome. Now, I, I mentioned those challenges. And you start to think, like, you know, why, why is it difficult? There's, there's a lot of reasons, right? You see, instructionally, you know, we know that we have kids that have some, some learning gaps. And we need to really help them. And socially as well, we well, ran across... Um, I think on social media uh, just the other day from a, a group called We Are Teachers. And I saw this chart and it really opened my eyes as to why we might be having some of the challenges. It's crazy to think this, but for our seniors, the last time they had a regular, normal, full school year, they were freshmen. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's crazy to think that. You think about our seventh graders, the last time that they were uh, had a normal school year. They were fourth grade. They were still in elementary school, uh, not even to intermediate yet. And so you can see it all the way down and, and all the way through our pre-K to grade twos, so they've never experienced a regular school year. So there is so much that our teachers need to instill into our students about um, not only how to handle the academic world, but even the social world, right? Do you think if your last normal year was in elementary and you, you skipped basically having any type of normalcy during the intermediate, now you're in junior high, and you have to learn all the new social constructs and all the, the, the new freedoms, and those are challenges that occur, and, and we're seeing some of those things pop up. One of the things that you've probably heard of that's been out there in the media are these TikTok challenges, and that was something people had uh, asked about. You know, are we seeing uh, any of those challenges? And I'll tell you, you know, I talked to our principals, and, yeah, you know, a few weeks ago we were having – uh, some issues with that. It's important, parents, that you take the time to have conversations with your students about their behavior and, and what you expect and how you expect them to treat our school buildings, your school buildings, the buildings that we've all paid our tax money um, to build and, and keep nice for our kids, but also the staff members that, that we employ to go to these buildings every day. It's important that you have conversations with them because uh, what I'll share with you is like, while we don't want to criminalize children's behavior, if children act out in a way that is criminal, then we have to treat it that way, and we will. We won't tolerate um, them destroying our buildings. Uh, you know, there's a whole list, and I'm not going to give it any publicity here um, tonight. You can probably Google it and find it. But you know, the September challenge was to da to damage a school restroom, and we saw some of that. But the October challenge becomes 
um, what I would say is, is really almost assault on a school employee. Um, you know, if your child gets involved in any of those things, and absolutely they will face school consequences and potentially criminal legal side as well. And as I look through these, I see things that are horrible, um, borderline sexual assault, um, just awful things that someone out there on TikTok is trying to put out to say it's a good idea or kids should do this and it would be funny. It's not funny at all. I know you don't find it funny as parents. We don't find it funny uh, either, but it's important that you have conversations with your students. Uh, I'm still waiting for somebody to come up with a great list, you know, like um, we had one circulating here internally, like, you know, October seems like a great month to turn in all your homework assignments and November, um, you know, seems like a great month to be thankful to everyone and 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 pass along your thank your thanks and december maybe is a you know a, a great month to honor someone with gifts or whatever it may be to find something positive to come out of social media instead of just this negative um, that we're seeing as i said we've seen it slow down i hope that this is a phase that has moved on and unfortunately we've had some students that have gotten themselves into somewhat major trouble and um sadly enough i, I think sometimes it does take that example being set uh, of, of folks getting in trouble before all kids will realize that you can't behave that way. Um, you know, there's, we have cameras in our buildings and we, we monitor our buildings to make sure that, that everyone is safe. So um, just to answer that question, you know, do we punish students that, that partake in this? Absolutely we do. Uh, we don't tolerate that type of behavior. And so it's really important for you to be proactive, have those conversations, just as our principals are doing on campus. I know I've seen it in a lot of newsletters as well. So, um, but that goes back to that piece of to help our children grow up a little bit, right? It's been a long time since they've all been in the buildings and new expectations. And so we're going to do our part to make sure not only to fill those gaps instructionally, but also socially uh, to help them understand the new responsibilities and roles of being uh, in the grade that they're in now and that they're you know no longer um, that that second grader is no longer a kindergartner we want to see second grade behavior in second grade and not kindergarten behavior but our, i know our campuses are doing a great job when i talk to the principals i hear them talk about that and some of those challenges but they're addressing it and and they'll do uh, a wonderful job of it as well so let's get into a little bit of data we like to look at numbers we like to kind of be very upfront with you and show you exactly what's going on uh, you see the same numbers that i see going through this process like I did four weeks ago. I'm going to do it tonight just so that you can see the way I see it and hear kind of the way that I like to analyze it and think about it as well. So let's pull up our website here. If you go to the main Conroe ISD website and you can see it here, um, you go to roadmap to remaining open here on the very front page and it brings you here. Let's start with our dashboard. So over here on the right, you can go and see the COVID-19 dashboard. We click that. Now, one of the things that I always like to do when I start, just to, just to begin this, is I, I go here to the start date. It kind of defaults a little bit to show you one month of data. Well, at this point in the year, I like to see the whole school year. So I always go back and ask it to start on August 9th so that I can see the full school year. So this is where we start. Well, up here at the top, you can see uh, total active cases right now in Conroe ISD are 217 active cases. Uh, it's 186 cases with students and 31 cases with employees. Now, I did not do my math, so maybe students, I want to challenge you. Those of you that are out there watching right now, you can, you can check this. But I, I'm going to roughly look at it and say that's about... Uh, 0.3 of a percent of our students and and roughly about the same i'd say that really right at 0.3 of a of one percent 0.3 of one percent not three percent 0.3 of one percent uh of total active positive cases in conroe isd so when you when you think about this as the numerator and the denominator right the numerator for student active cases is 186 but the denominator is just under 68,000, so 67,800. So you do that division, that'll give you your, your percentage. Same with employee active cases, it's 31, and the denominator there is 10,000. So um, the total number of active cases right now is very low. Um, you know, We were at points where we would dream and hope and wish to be at 2% 
or one percent. Now we're way less than half a percent. Uh, so that's a good thing. Now, as we look at our, our positive reports by day, uh, so let's just take a look at this chart and uh, let's look at look at it by uh, just students first. And you can see here that, um, you know, Mondays are always our biggest day. And so you kind of look at Mondays and then you see it tapers as the rest of the week. But you can see from where we were uh, in early August to where we are now this week, we are now actually below where we started the school year, below the first week of school, uh, which is a, a great thing. Uh, the numbers are very, uh, very much improved from where they were. Now let's look at employees only. And I'll remind you, you know, the question comes up, well, you know, what was the driving forces of if we would close school or we wouldn't close school? It was all, it's always driven by employee availability, right? If we don't have enough employees to have a school open safely, that's where we would run into problems. So you can see our employee positive tests, you know, compared to where we were on, you know, days here, um, you know, a month ago when we were having uh, 38 positive tests in a day to today where we had one positive test. And once again, 10,000 employees in Conroe ISD yesterday, just three positive cases. Now, uh, I think we have another chart. Andrew, if you wouldn't mind putting that other chart, this, this helps us visualize this graphic a little better. There it is. So you can really see um, that we peaked in week three and how those positive cases have really fallen off since week three. And then you can see like just since we last spoke, um, how it has really dropped off you know, just so significantly uh, since our last conversation. So that's the positive reports. Now, the chart that I really kind of like more because I think it's more inclusive of everybody because for the positive report, somebody actually needs to go be tested and then they need to report their information back to us. So that's possible that some kids could be sick and not ever report back. So I, I like to look at this isolated chart and you can see from this isolated chart kind of the bell curve is very easy to see on this chart it's it's easy to see when we peaked um, there at the end of august and then here we are now a month later um, so uh, in so much better shape so let's look at just students once again here so we click off employees and we can look just at students so we can go back here uh, students isolated back on 827 was over 3,000 students isolated okay uh, on 827. Today, just 371 students isolated. So, you know, from our peak to today, um, you know, we are at a point where it's, that's 80, you know, we're, we're over 80% decrease uh, from that point to today. This, this is a really positive sign. Um, and let's look at employees kind of the same way we'll isolate them. So once again, you can see going all the way back to the start of school to today, we have fewer employees isolated today than we've had at any point during the school year. Um, that is a wonderful thing. It's great that our, our staff is healthy and we, we love having them at work, taking care of our kids. So the, the data here is really uh, powerful. It's really positive. Uh, and I think, you know, when we, when we've had conversations or I've either sent a video and told you that, Hey, we are at a very critical moment there after at the end of the first week of school to our conversation a month ago, where we said, we have to do some things to make this happen. We've done the things we needed to do. And now we've, we are seeing the results here, uh, on our dashboard and with the data. So let's go in and we'll go back to the, to the dashboard once again, and, and see, uh, how our employee attendance and our subfill rate is one of the things that I would point out to you. We're now, you know, well above 60% in our subfill rates. We're seeing days at 70%. Uh, we would like to be at, you know, 95, 100%. And, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about our subs here uh, in a bit, but, but it's, uh, it's in a much better place than it was uh, even a few weeks ago. Student attendance. I know that was something that that I had a lot of questions about. People were really concerned about that um, before our last conversation four weeks ago. And I, there were many questions about student attendance. And we've encouraged you all to keep your children at home when they're sick. And we kind of made that plea to you. And I think that's one of the behaviors that really changed for us that helped us um, to get to this much better situation. I think we were um, very intentional about keeping sick kids at home there. Um, and it it helped us to kind of end that cycle of, of our numbers skyrocketing. And so today, you know, we're seeing um, attendance back in the 94, 95% range, which is 
um, really close to normal for us. So we, we are really right back at normal attendance rates uh, for kids, and that's something that makes us very happy as well. So um, that, that's a wonderful thing. Now, for as much as our data is looking great, the county data is still a little concerning. Um, so you, COVID is not over. Like we, we all have to understand that. Like we can, it, you can be happy and excited and hopeful that we are in a much better place, but at the same time, we still need to be um, aware and intentional about our behaviors because it's not over. So this is the county chart. I think we have the more elongated county chart that we can put up. There's, there it is, Andrew, thank you so much. So you can see um, the numbers in the county are falling pretty rapidly, but they're still high. So there's still a lot of COVID in our community. Now, what I, what I will say about the county numbers is I think our numbers are more timely. So when we first began to spike, you didn't see that immediate spike in the county numbers. I think their information might lag a few days, and that's because they have to compile information from all of the the doctor's offices and testing centers and all that. They have to they often get sent to the county, and then the county uploads them and reports them out three times a week. Where our data on our dashboard is real time. It updates twice daily. You tell us at nine o'clock in the morning about a positive, it goes in the dashboard, it will be there in the one o'clock update. So for the most part, I think our data is faster. So I, I, we see the trend happening now in the county and I believe we will see that continue in the county. Uh, it will mirror what, what we have done. Um, you think about our size in comparison to the county. Um, there are five school district, five other school districts in the county, but all of them combined are not as big as us. So we, we are a majority of the county. So you know, we're gonna drive numbers. So you, you can see that on the chart as well. So I, I believe that we're going to see um, their numbers continue to fall and, and we'll be hopeful for that in the community. We want our whole community to be healthy as much as we want our schools to be healthy. I've also talked to some of our hospital uh, leadership in the area and they are beginning to see their numbers go down as well. Once again, hospitalizations typically lag uh, a few weeks behind um, you know current positivity data. So, uh, But that's a positive thing that we are hearing uh, that, that their numbers are going down. So we, we're really happy about that. So th those are the numbers. That's kind of the way that I look at them um, when we look at numbers. And we're going to go now back to that very initial, um, let's see here, back to the, the beginning of the roadmap to reopening or remain open website and we'll talk about our safety alert level so you can see here our current safety alert level is level four if you click here you can go to our chart i'll zoom in a little bit help you read it and help me read it as well and we had to make that move to level four after the first week of school and we were seeing really significant cases in our buildings and we were um, on that edge of where we're going to have enough staff and we were seeing a lot of people become infected and we needed to ramp up to level four and i know that everyone didn't like that it, we don't like it either there's so many of those events that we weren't able to have that are really the lifeblood of what we do i was speaking to um, a great elementary principal today and he was you know telling me about the special events and how much they help to fill him up every day and so not having them is is really somewhat depressing for our staff too. And so uh, what I'm excited to tell you tonight is because of the work that we have done as a community, uh, on Monday, we will be reducing our level here in Conroe ISD to level three. So what does that mean now that we make this move from level four to level three? Well, let's first talk about what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we go wide open right away. It doesn't mean that we forget how to do everything that we've been doing that has helped us get to this point, okay? Uh, this is a way that we do more, but we do more carefully, all right? So uh, in everything that we've done over these last two years, we're very intentional, um, we're measured, we think through things, and we, we act. When you think about how big we are, this is a big giant ship, you can't just turn it on a dime, so you have to be very intentional about the way uh, that you make decisions. So that's how we're going to make this move from level four to level three. So we will begin now to have more normal events on campus. They may still have to have some different structures, right? So they may still have to have, um, you know, rather than one night of an event, we might need to have two nights and spread it out or, or, or different things like that may happen. But um, we will continue with our cleaning regimens. 
okay, um, over these next few weeks. So we're, we're still doing our misting in the building, all common areas, all classrooms every night. Uh, after we go for a couple of weeks that we've been in level three, if we still see our numbers staying low, we will begin to reduce the amount of e-misting in the classrooms every night. Um, once again, and we talked about this at the beginning of the year, we feel like that might be overkill at this point, and the chemical is not without its own concern. And so as we can begin to back off of that, we will, but we don't want to pull that out too quickly, right? So we'll, we'll begin to bring that down. Uh, for many of you, I know what you'll be excited to hear is that we will now be able to once again welcome visitors into our buildings. Now, that is a process, right? Once again, it's not wide open. I know that for the last year and a half, many of you have been uh, just really wanting to go eat lunch with your child. That's something that's important to you. It's important to your family, and you really want to do that. We can't have you all show up on Monday. Uh, it just won't work. Uh, the, it'll be too many. And so you'll, you'll be getting communication from your principals about how that will work at your school. And it will look different at every school. And, and uh, I get questions about that sometimes. Why is our school different than another school? Well, logistics plays a large role, right? Some of our elementary schools in particular have gyms and cafeterias. And so they have a lot more space than our elementary schools that don't have gyms and cafeterias. It's all one unit and it's a much smaller area. Uh, and so they may have to limit for that reason. Uh, some of our schools, uh, for instance, uh, Broadway Elementary, uh, Stewart Elementary is really full. Snyder Elementary is like 130% capacity. So just having their students in the cafeteria, the cafeteria is already full. Uh, so they're going to look for ways to be able to invite parents in. But like I said, it will be limited, but it's a start, right? Here we go. This is a, a big step for us. Uh, moving into getting into normal activities. I know one of the questions that uh, was sent in was, well, you know, what about homecoming dances? Are we, uh, what do we think about that? And I think this is the opportunity now for high schools to start having those conversations about getting those scheduled and, uh, and having that event. So I know that you're going to get a lot more information uh, from your schools in the coming days about what will this process of reopening look like. And it, like I said, it will look different everywhere. Some of our schools still have students eating lunch in the cafeteria while others have been in the cafeteria, but they've been spread out. So they're going to work on ways to, to, you know, for some of those schools to even get kids into the cafeteria and then also to be able to welcome parents. Uh, for others, they'll be working on, you know, how do we get more kids into the cafeteria at once? But we want to make sure we're doing the safe and smart we don't want to do anything that will have me come back on here in three weeks and say, okay, it didn't work. We got to go back to level four. It's the last thing we want to do. So we want to just kind of slowly move this out. But uh, hopefully that makes you excited for those of you that have really been uh, wanting to get into the buildings. Now, once again, what are we not getting rid of? We're not getting rid of that cleaning every day. We're going to keep the sanitation stations. We're still going to encourage people to wash their hands and do all those things. Mask use is still recommended. Uh, it's still your choice. You can, it is your choice as to how you do that, but we still think it's a, it's a good idea for you to do that at this point. Um, we have one new thing that I want to share with you tonight that's also going to happen uh, in our buildings. And this is a new technology. I mentioned it to you last last time we were together that we were going to take this idea to our school board. And I, I will just tell you, I cannot commend our school board enough um, for their dedication and their investment in the safety of our buildings to keep our students safe and our staff safe. Um, we went out and researched this new technology uh, of an air cleaning system. So these are portable units that can come in and they they use uh, great filters to kept to capture not only COVID-19, but all the things that float around in our building. So from strep throat to chicken pox, all the, all the airborne viruses and, and bacteria that could be out there, they capture them. And they not only just capture it, but what makes this technology different is it uses heat then to kill what it captures so that it does not just blow it right back out into the building. So that that's exciting technology for us. Um, because it doesn't use a chemical. It's not introducing anything harmful into our buildings, which we, we want to be able to get safer by being safe, right? We don't want to just introduce something else that could be a problem. So um, we have tested a few of these out in our buildings, and our school board has made a great investment in this technology now to bring this to all of our buildings. I have uh, some pictures here. We'll show you what these devices look like. If you want to learn more about these devices, you can go to the website. It's ivpair.com. ivpair, 
unitsdirectly.com. And what you see here on your screen are the three different sizes of units. Now to help you out with the scale here, that large unit uh, is about six foot tall. That's what you call a venue unit. Uh, so it is made for really large spaces. Every one of our campuses will be receiving one of these units to be placed in their cafeteria. Um, we know that we have a lot of bodies in the cafeteria. You can't wear masks in the cafeteria when you're eating. Uh, so we are going to have one of these in every single one of our cafeterias. Once again, believe it not only helps with COVID, but it's going to help with uh, a lot of other uh, things as well, just to help make our schools cleaner and safer and healthier, which would be, which will be wonderful. So every school receives, will receive a big unit. The next unit down there, um, once again, for scale, that's a, I don't know, it's about the size of a, of a paper shredder, maybe a little bigger than that. So just a couple of feet tall. It's more of a classroom size unit. Uh, our elementary campuses will receive three of those units. Our secondary campuses will receive five and the principals will place them as they see fit. You know, so you might see those in, in some common classrooms, be it um, music rooms or um, libraries, things of that nature, Thing, areas where we can't cohort students as well. So you get a lot of different students uh, coming together. You, you may see that unit in there. And then that tabletop unit is a, is a smaller unit meant for smaller areas. Uh, so you will see either that small little tabletop unit or that mid-size unit in every single one of our Conroe ISD nurses clinics as well. So every school is going to have a big unit in the common area. They're going to have one of these units in their nurse's office to make sure that we keep that area as clean as we can. And then additionally, the principals will have a few other units that they can deploy as they see fit. Now we expect uh, these units to begin arriving within the next two weeks. Uh, so when your students ask you, you know, tell you that, hey, they're, you know, I saw this new thing in my cafeteria, you'll know exactly what it is. Uh, once again, it's IVP Air, if you would like to go and, and check that out, learn more about it. Um, but, you know, they, they run, you kind of hear the fan blowing. We, we have tried them out uh, in some of our buildings. We've taken them to newer buildings, older buildings. You just plug them in to make sure that they were going to work. And uh, they worked beautifully in our trial period. Um, they have a fan speed, so, you know, you can, you can ramp them up or turn them down if, as the teacher's trying to teach, you know, if it's in a room with the, the classroom or if, let's say, it's in the library and a class comes in they could turn the, the fan motor down so that you could hear the conversation then turn it back up um, when they leave. I would tell you in a cafeteria, we'll have it running probably full blast because there's enough noise and activity in there anyway. It's not going to be uh, any type of distraction. But thank you once again to our uh, Conroe ISD School Board for uh, making the financial investment um, and the investment in our health of our students and our staff to help us make that purchase. So um, that's another one of the things that we're doing to help make sure that we're staying safe as we're doing this reopening process and getting back um, to more normal activities. So um, exciting news. Once again, it was, uh, I'm kind of quoting Dr. Hines, our deputy superintendent. He, he used the phrase the other day with our principals, doing more carefully. Uh, it was the way he put it. And I just thought it was exactly, uh, he, he captured it beautifully, doing more carefully is, is where we are, um, but th that's exciting. And I hope that you see the data and it makes you feel good that we are in a much better place. Um, I think we should all be positive and excited about it. I think you can be excited about it without also, you know, it's not one or the other. You, it's not that you, uh, you have to be excited, which means you think COVID is over. You can be excited and still know that we have work to do as a community and we, we're going to continue that work, but, but I'm, unapologetically excited about the fact that our numbers are significantly lower today than they were. And so for those of you out there, parents that, that I've talked to over the last month that said, Hey, you know, I, I don't really feel comfortable with my kids starting school year. I want to wait and see what happens, let the numbers, you know, work themselves out before I send my kid. This is, I think a perfect window for you. So he, this opens a window as we finish this first nine weeks, next week, we'll end the nine weeks. The following week we're closed on Monday. We'll open on Tuesday, October 12th, as the first day of the second nine weeks. So if this is that window that maybe you want to switch from our virtual program back to in-person, or if you've been out of Conroe ISD, whether you're homeschooling or you've been doing some other um, type of plan, just waiting for that moment of when you're going to send your child back, 
I believe this is a great window for you. Uh, if you are going to bring them back to start the second nine weeks, here's a request that we have for you. Please notify your school by next Tuesday, October 5th. Uh, that gives the school time to make the adjustments to schedules and, and know exactly what they're going to deal with as we start the second nine weeks. What we don't want to do is have a, a big line on that first day of the second nine weeks and we're trying to make adjustments on the fly. So if you could communicate, that would be great. I, I expect hundreds of kids will be returning and checking into school on October 12th. So I think if you can be proactive in that, uh, it'll save frustration on your end. It'll help us be better prepared um, and ready to take care of you and your child. And, and the uh, re-enrollment process will be much smoother uh, if you can do that kind of ahead of time along the way. Um, I, I mentioned I would say something else about substitutes as well. I think for many of our substitutes that have been um, you know, maybe not picking up jobs, perhaps you, uh, you know, retired teachers or some that were, you know, at a point early in the year, they said, yeah, there's just a little too much virus going on in the buildings. I, I don't feel comfortable, uh, picking up jobs. I, I, to you, I say now's the time as well. Um, you know, we're, our numbers are, are, you know, significantly down. We're not seeing the viral spread in our buildings. Uh, I, I believe it's a safe time for you as well to get back uh, to picking up jobs. So we hope that you'll do that, encourage you to do that. Um, there's a lot of reasons that we, we need you subs. Um, you know, it's not just about when a teacher's out sick, but there's, there are times when we want to get our teachers together for staff development, for planning purposes, to help them uh, really, you know, be great at what they do every day. But we need substitutes to help us do that. And right now we're not able to do all of those activities because we're, we're trying to make sure we have um, the subs we need uh, just to cover sick teachers. So uh, for those of you that are out there and, you're, and you've just been wondering when is that time, I think now is the time and we encourage you to get back out and, and help us as well. Now, one other thing I'll show you on the internet just here before we jump into live questions is uh, our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, and obviously you go to YouTube, here, here we are tonight, but one of the things that you'll notice on our YouTube channel is the you'll see our Conroe ISD Athletics uh, YouTube channel. So we have an athletics YouTube channel for both Moorhead Stadium and Wood Forest Stadium. And you can watch and, and, and subscribe to those. Let me just click on the Wood Forest Stadium. Uh, let's see. And you'll notice that you can go back and you'll see archived events. We have no live events tonight. Um, all of our teams are away or off this week. But you can see archived games. And when they're live, you can watch games live right here on our YouTube channel. So in much the same way that you watch these events, if you watch them live or, or you stream them later, you can put them up on your TV it's an HD feed and you can watch it. And this is a great way to teach your kids about what the high school experience is going to be like, right? Um, some may want to be athletes and play football on the field, but there's so much uh, other activity that happens at a football game. I really call it a community event. And that's highlighted when you watch our live stream. You get to see the marching band. You get to see the drill team and the cheerleaders and the JROTC and the student section and what it means to be uh, a great student and just all of the, the camaraderie and pageantry that goes along with high school. And, and so if you haven't made it out to a game, what a great opportunity for you to really kind of become a part of your high school community as by watching a few on YouTube. And hopefully then maybe then you'll, you'll feel comfortable and, and get excited about making your way out to Moorhead stadium or Wood Forest stadium to um, watch our kids play and compete and perform um, because it's, it'll truly fill you up. It's a, uh, it, it's a wonderful night every night that we have those games and, and, and encourage you to not just get out to those events, but get to the fine arts events, uh, that are happening on campus as well. Once again, we're going to see more and more of these normal, more normal activities happening. So I encourage you to come out for our seniors out there. Uh, remind you that we have our senior priority pass. So for our senior citizens that are residents of Conroe ISD, you have an opportunity to get a senior priority pass that will get you into many of those events, those non-playoff events or non-fundraiser events, free of charge. So you can get out. What a, what a great way to spend an evening 
that wouldn't cost you any money to come out and, and see a great fine arch performance or uh, go to a, an athletic event uh, for free and support the community. Maybe you have grandchildren uh, out there playing. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just want to be uh, out and support the neighborhood kids, and that would be wonderful as well. So we would love to have you. If you need more information about the Senior Priority Pass, you can find it on our website as well. All right. Now I'm going to switch over here to some questions and see if I can't uh, roll through them. Um, question about a mask mandate. We, we kind of really went through that in our four weeks ago. If you'd like to go back and, and look at that, it's on our YouTube channel. We've talked about the legalities of, of not having uh, mask mandates. Many of the districts that have tried to put them in place are now being sued by the Attorney General. So legally, we can't have a mask mandate. Um, once again, I'd go back and say, you know, look, if you look at our numbers today, we're in a very, very good place uh, with our numbers. Um, why don't the dashboard numbers match the notices we receive about positive cases? So um, it depends on when notices might be sent out. So um, potentially you might get a notice that says there were three positive cases today in your building, and then it goes out at one o'clock. And then by the end of the day, there's actually been five positive cases in your building. And so the dashboard is going to reflect that full number. So, you know, there's a little bit of data that can move, you know, one day or another so you can see some variances um, i do feel really good about our data i think it's i think it's solid it's timely it's accurate um, and and it's real so you i believe you can trust it and so i know some people we had the question when our numbers were high some people were questioning like oh you're you're we think you're making it up and i can assure you we wouldn't do that because there was no fun involved in that and then they started coming down and other people were saying oh now you're hiding cases no we're not we never hide cases we don't do that we it's super transparent i think we're as uh, transparent than any school district or, or as transparent as any and probably more transparent than most uh, in the way we share information with you and the way we share data and, and talk through this uh, with you um Question about COVID testing. Well, let, let's talk about our COVID testing. Um, we have our site at the police station where uh, we can do COVID testing. As four weeks ago, we were actually worked on a plan to ramp up where we doubled our ability to test uh, people uh, on a daily basis. And immediately our cases started falling and the demand for testing went down. So we've now retracted back to our uh, normal size testing and the demand is not there. So it's, you know, we're, we're not seeing nearly the number of people even asking to be tested, much less testing positive um, at our station. So that's, that's good news too, right? Unless people are sick and, and needing to be tested, but we're there if you need us. Um, in some cases, we do have our nurses that can perform some rapid testing uh, on campus. So only certain campuses have that capability. If you're at one of those campuses, you, you know that probably, uh, but not all campuses can, uh, can do that. Um, let's see, uh, question about homecoming dances. We did talk about that. Um, so hopefully we're going to see more, more of that coming, uh, in the coming, uh, in the coming weeks, our high schools will begin those plannings, uh, planning for those events. Uh, I mentioned Broadway and Snyder earlier, and there's a question here. Are there any plans to address the overcrowded elementary schools? in Spring Trails, Harmony, Bender's, Lander, Bender's Landing region. Yes, as part of the 2019 bond package, there's an elementary that will be built in that area. We're actually in the final stages of purchasing the land for that elementary school. It will open in the 2023 school year. So this time next year, we will begin the rezoning process down there uh, in that Grand Oaks feeder area to, to begin to populate that new school. And it will open in the 2023 um, school year. So that's, that's taken care of there. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, what is being done about buses so crowded, um, that not everybody has a seat. So busing crowded, uh, overcrowding is a challenge. So as we are short bus drivers, certainly we have sometimes with the combine routes or split routes, which then create situations where, um, you know, the kids get home late or different things can happen. Uh, we may also have a route that on a normal day, uh, 40 kids ride that route. And then on whatever day it may be, let's say it's Friday because there's no, 
football practice or no extracurricular activities, all of a sudden 80 kids show up to ride the bus that day. And so that, that also can create a problem for us. The, the routes that are consistently overcrowded, um, we make those adjustments. So those are routing adjustments that need to be made. Uh, if you send an email to our transportation department, if you have concerns about a specific route, uh, we can make sure to go check those. They have the ability to, you know, they can go and look at the camera, they can count the number of kids, you know, make sure that what was it a situation that um, kids weren't sharing the seats, there were seats available, but they, for whatever reason, they didn't occupy them all, or what do we need to address those? Along those same lines, there was a question about um, school buses. Are we planning to invest in any systems that can help us track our school buses? Yes, we are working on that presently. Uh, so we're going through a process that's going to help us um, and help you to be able to see more accurately where buses are. That's Once again, it's a process for us. That's one of the challenges of being big is that things can't happen as quickly. Um, you know, we have over 500 buses, so to outfit all of them with the proper equipment will take some time, but we are in that process. We, we also believe that that's important um, for you to know. And, and, you know, we try to send those emails, but it's not the same thing as you being able to live track and know that, Hey, the, you know, the bus is running five minutes early or five minutes late. So we we're working on that. It'll just take a little bit of time um, to make that happen, but it's coming. So that, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, Another question about COVID notifications. Why, why sometimes do we get them uh, so late? So wh wh why does it happen um, that, you know, that you get a notification that somebody was at the school a week later? We're only as good as the information we get. So uh, as soon as we're notified, we notify you. We don't sit on that information, but it might be that we don't get the information until four or five days later. And it might just be because the, the family did not have an opportunity to test. So they got their testing appointment maybe two or three days later, and it took two or three days to get the results back. So by the time they report it to us as a positive, it's a week old. We're still gonna tell you, and we're gonna put the accurate date on there, but it does come through uh, a little later. So that, that happens. Um, let's see. Um, Let's see here. Looking through. Um, our, we, we do still have our virtual uh, school option. Uh, it's open. Um, there is a waiting list if people are interested in getting on that waiting list. As we talked about, uh, when we open that option, it, it is planned to end at the end of the first semester. So that, that plan at this point has not changed. Um, and so if you're interested in getting on a waiting list at this time, you can uh, go about that process. Um, we're, we, we do have more students that are moving out of virtual back into in-person instruction. So it could be possible that uh, there'd be a spot open, but um, but I, I can't make that promise. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but that would be an option for you if you wanted to um, apply back to that. Uh, let's see, I think. Just so you know how this works, I, I've had somebody ask the question of me, like, do you are these really live questions or this, do you just stage this up? No, this is actually a Google Doc that, that I'm on and Sarah Blakelock, our Director of Commun Communications, and she's on in, in the other room. And so she's monitoring the questions as they come in. She takes those questions and she puts them here onto the Google Doc where I can access them and I can answer them as well. So, uh, you know, sometimes people are like, well, what's the point of doing this live? Why do you do it live? What's, why? Well, this is why we try to, we try to do this um, to, to help you and, and um, really answer questions along the way. Uh, let's see. I think that is going to wrap us up for most of our questions. Uh, once again, thank you for joining tonight. So much good, so much to be happy about, so much to be optimistic about. Um, as we take one step carefully here to open up a little more, once again, this is not wide open. Um, and so uh, I understand completely, there's gonna be some of you that are gonna think we should open further, and there's gonna be some of you that are gonna be very worried that we're opening anything at all. Um, what I can tell you all is that we're going to try to walk this very um, sensibly like we've always done uh, and, and we'll take it kind of one step at a time to get to um, one more step closer to normal and we'll watch it. Um, one of the things that does give me comfort about this school year is that we've, we've shown our ability to handle the spike and we know that if we have to ramp back up, we can. We've proven that. So 
if we get to a point later in the school year where we start to see a spike again, if we need to go back to, to level four, we will. And if that means we have to make some changes, we won't hesitate to do that to keep our schools safe. And at the same time, if we can get to a point where they just keep going down and eventually, you know, I don't think they're ever going away, uh, but if we can get to a more manageable point, then we might look to move, you know, more to a level two. But we'll have to watch that into the future. But we made that promise to you at the beginning of the school year that we would respond to the current data. And so that's what we're doing tonight uh, by making this move to level three. Hopefully that, that brings you all a lot of excitement as you can get back to more normal activities, be more engaged. We want you to be partners with us in your child's education. Uh, that's important for us. So your child will have the best education possible if we're doing a great job at school and you join us in that at school and do all the great things that you do at home. That gives your child the best chance to be successful, and we know that. So we want you to be partners with us, and part of that partnership is being with us. Uh, and so we're excited to welcome you back once again. Um, just know that it's a process. Know it'll look different everywhere. Your principals will be in touch. You'll get more and more communications about what that will look like at your school, but we're happy to welcome you all back. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hope that um, you were able to make it through the weather this week without um, too much trouble. And as we look forward to next week and a long weekend um, for staff and an extra long weekend for students, I hope that you have an opportunity to make some great memories with your family uh, here in the month of October. Thank you for being with us and have a great evening.